Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Volcan Bugel and Lisiski as Architect by Richard Anderson, published by MIT Press. After achieving international acclaim as a painter and designer, El Lisinski set out in 1924 to convince the world and himself that he was also an architect. He did this with a project for a horizontal skyscraper, which he gave an obscure and untranslatable name, Vulcan Bugel. Each of these buildings, perched atop of slender pillars, were intended to stand at major intersections along Moscow's boulevard ring, integrating the flow of tramlines, subways and elevators. In Volkenbügel, Richard Anderson explores Lisinski's translation of visual and textual media into spatial ideas and offers an in-depth study of the surviving drawings and archival artifacts related to Lisinski's most complex architectural proposal. This book offers a new and definitive account of how Lisinski expanded the conceptual and representational tools available for the modern architect by drawing on many sources, including photography, typography, exhibition design, and even the elementary forms of the alphabet to create the Volkenbügel. Anderson shows how the production and reception of a paper project served to link key ideas and relationships that animated the worlds of art and architecture, offering a new view on received histories of interwar avant-garde. By attending to Lisinski's singular architectural project, Anderson reveals the dynamics of internationality in the construction of modern architectural culture in Europe. The array of fields in which Lisinski worked is dizzying. Few individuals made such a significant impact on so many disciplines, and the sheer range of his work presents challenges to interpretation. In a seminal essay on his career as an artist, Yves Lembois waged that one can speak of multiple Lisinskis. L1, the artist of the Jewish Renaissance. L2, the suprematist painter. L3, the Stalin-era propagandist. Nancy Perloff construed the diversity of Lisinski's practices as part of the puzzle of his artistic identity in situating L. Lisinski, the edited volume that contains some of the most detailed studies of his work to date. Many writers on Lisinski have sought to elucidate the relationship among the putative periods of his creative activity, postulating either connections or radical breaks between them. Peter Nisbet, whose research has informed the work of a generation of scholars, has compellingly proposed that architecture and Lisinski's relative proximity or distance to it can serve as a critical threat through his career. Volken Bugel approaches Lisinski's multifarious profile from a different perspective. By focusing on a single project, it inverts the structure of received interpretations, exploring how Lisinski's many talents were brought to bear on an architectural idea. In doing so, it reveals both how his architecture was informed by his work in other fields and the ways that architectural design and criticism provide lenses to view his myriad activities. Volken Bugel thus leaves questions of Lisinski's multiple identities largely to one side. It describes instead the convergence of his many practices and successive creative periods in the concept of his extraordinary and improbable architectural project. But this is a story about more than one person. Lisinski had many collaborators and confidants throughout his life, but none were more important than Sophie Coopers, ne Schneider. Coopers was an art collector, curator and gallerist. Lisinski entered the world of architecture through paper. Through letters of introduction, invitations, drawings, manuscripts, photographs, and printed matter, he positioned himself within an emerging network of innovative architectural organizations in Europe and the Soviet Union. At the same time, he recognized early on that the creation of architectural objects, ideas, and images was not enough. They had to circulate as well. Lisinski was adept at disseminating his work, enabling him to narrate and thus secure his position at the origins of Soviet architectural development. 
but he worried that the projects he created on paper were destined to remain there, unbuilt. His desire to engage with real construction would be continuously postponed in his efforts to convince his contacts and himself that he was indeed an architect. The Volkenbügel took definite form amid Lezinski's efforts to establish his reputation in the world of architecture as a writer, networker and designer. His connections to the group of architects gathered around the journal ABC provided the expertise he needed to articulate the complex structure and his correspondence with them documents a process of architectural design conducted through the post. The earliest extant description of Lezinski's project as the Volkenbügel appeared in a letter which also contained design queries and structural recommendations from Emil Roth in November 1924. Roth was among the founding members of ABC and he helped translate Lezinski's spatial ideas into plausible tectonic form. Their exchange records a period of intense design activity between November 1924 and February of the following year. The Volkenbügel was born of the circulation of documents. Lisinski developed his project in letters exchanged with Roth. Key decisions about the structure, for example three pillars rather than four, were made based on the sketches, drawings and recommendations that travelled between Roth and Lisinski through the post. While drawings and information passed between the two correspondents throughout the design phase, once Lisinski determined that the Volkenbügel was complete, he began systematically distributing images of it through multiple channels. This activity amounted to the converse of the effort that he, Coopers and Arp had put into the production of the isms of art. Instead of making a collection of images and documents, the issue was now their dissemination. For Lisinski, the process involved reproducing and scaling his drawings, shrinking, masking and editing them along the way. It also required reproducing the drawings at large scale to be mounted and shipped for display in a variety of contexts. Together, Lisinski and Coopers managed the stock of originals and reproductions. They drew on this inventory as they sent images to friends, journals and curators in a campaign to launch the Volkenbügel into the world. Lisinski conceived the Volkenbügel as a tool for clarification and disambiguation, processes that served its ultimate purpose, to organize the visual experience of the city. This environment, saturated by competing modes of visual communication, posters, shop windows, tram lines, electric lights, an experience from new points of view at the feet of skyscrapers from tall buildings and in flight was the object of Lisinski's formal ambitions. The Volkenbügel was a device for the training of visual perception. Lisinski understood that publication and exhibition go hand in hand in the promotion of architecture. He had installed his uh, Prunen Raum at the Great Berlin Art Exhibition in 1923, where Miss van der Rohe had exhibited his concrete office building, villa in rainforest concrete and other visionary projects. He had seen the exhibition of international architects in Weimar in 1923, the event that ultimately led to Gropius' book Internationale Architektur. He was fluent in the conventions and procedures of exhibiting his work, and he sized upon the exhibition as a key site for communicating architectural ideas to the public. The history of the Volkenbügel's public display shows how Lisinski navigated a complex network of institutions in his effort to insert his work into an international architectural culture. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.